Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for joining me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can click the like or subscribe button and I'm also pleased to announce that you can also help out the show by donating using the Patreon link in the description below. I have finally done it. I opened a Patreon account. The website is patreon.com slash breaking biotech. So I'm going to get rid of that tip jar link and put that instead. And I'm also pleased to announce that what comes with this along with all sorts of different tiers includes a Discord channel. So for just $3 a month, you can join the Discord. It's pretty early, I'm not going to lie. There's about uh, 15 or so of us right now. But I'm hoping to grow this to be a nice little community of people where we can bat ideas around biotech stocks and stuff like that. So check that out. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And then other stuff that I'm going to do are things like shoutouts with that with larger tier donations. And, and one person that made a very generous donation, I'm not going to use their name, I don't think they, they wanted that, but I'm going to plug their blog. So if you're interested in psychophysiological processing, check out this person's blog at firststepoutofdarkness.wordpress.com. That's firststepoutofdarkness.wordpress.com. And I want to thank them greatly for the donation. I want to thank everybody who jumped on this immediately. I, uh, it's been like a week or so, and already I'm very impressed and pleased with how many people have jumped in. So I, uh, I do thank you all very much for that. And I appreciate all the subscribers, too. So we're at 970 right now. So if you guys want to share the show with some people and push me over 1,000, that would be a huge milestone. So, so that's the latest what's going on. And for today's show, I wanted to touch on a few different companies. We're going to start with Exact Sciences and the updates they shared in the last couple of weeks. Then I'm going to talk about Regeneron and their latest treatment for COVID-19. And then the main story I want to talk about is Marathi Therapeutics. And I want to do a follow-on for my interview that I did with WX Capital. So for kind of a primer on that, go check out that video on their channel. They're a great group of guys, and they, they really know what they're doing too. So check out their channel and subscribe. Check out that video first as well before this. It might be more helpful for you. But I want to expand on some of the things that we touched on and also kind of break down my ideas in a bit more depth that I wasn't able to get in with their show. So that's going to be the show. Overall, things are going pretty good. Been a hectic week, I got to say, politically with the debates and then the Trump diagnosis for COVID-19. So things are very, very uncertain right now. But we'll get into that in a bit. So to start, I want to talk about Exact Sciences, ticker symbol EXAS, and they are now trading at around a $12 billion market cap. And what they announced is liquid biopsy testing data in six different cancer types showing a sensitivity of 86% and a specificity of 95%. And they did kind of a, a grab bag of cancer types. We have lung, ovarian, liver, pancreatic, and esophageal. And so I did a video on exact sciences quite a while ago. I thought their valuation was a little bit toppy back then and was waiting for a dip to buy in. And that's what I did during the COVID crisis. I took a small position and then I sold just recently at around 94 and I think it's trading just over $100 right now. But this is nice to see them kind of moving into new areas because I think one of the things that they're struggling with is leaning on their old testing kits, the Cologuard, while all these other companies are trying to get into things like liquid biopsy, which it's going to be a real game changer in the space once these treatments get validated and approved by the FDA. Now, they're not alone in doing this. Exact Sciences is kind of just finally getting into this because other big players like Illumina through Grail, they just acquired this private company called Grail officially. Uh, we've Garden Health, Personalis has kind of been floating around, and uh, Invitae as well, who just acquired Archer DX. So there's a lot of companies in the space, but Exact Sciences has shown some pretty good success in their previous testing kits, so it just makes sense for them to jump into this new area and be a good competitor. So I think right now, probably a little bit toppy with the price around 100, but I'm pretty pleased with the small profit I made given the number of shares that I have. So that's Exact Sciences. I want to move now into Regeneron, ticker symbol REGN, and they're trading at a $60 billion market cap. I did a video on them also a few months ago, looking at kind of their staples in terms of the different products that they offer. And I concluded that they were relatively overvalued back then. I think now also a little bit overvalued, but it does depend on how well their products sell and the kind of revenue they can bring in, obviously. But the news that we heard is that they released data on their antibody cocktail for COVID-19. And what we saw is that it reduced viral loads and symptoms versus placebo in non-hospitalized patients who are infected with SARS-CoV-2. And what they shared are results from an initial cohort of 275 patients 
and they also have 900 or more patients enrolled. So this is kind of a preliminary analysis that they're showing us. And they've called it a phase one, two, three trial. So they're doing the PK, the safety, along with the efficacy and other sorts of secondary outcomes all at once. And when I looked through their stuff, they started off by kind of categorizing patients based on seronegative or seropositive. And I think it's important that they do this because we're looking at a treatment for COVID-19. And if people are already seropositive, it means that their body's already mounted an antibody response in order to bring down viral loads. So what Regeneron is trying to pose here is that the seronegative patients, which means they have not mounted that antibody response, have a significantly higher viral load, and they make a better target for most treatments probably, but also their antibody cocktail that they're going to share us data with. So then... The data that they show here shows a range of efficacy based off of viral load. So we have 10 to the power of 4 copies per ml all the way to 10 to the 7 copies per ml. So quite a big range in uh, viral load here. And I just blew this up on the screen and what we're seeing is that at the higher viral load, the treatment, and there are two different doses here in the green and the red line, we see that there's a much more dramatic decrease in the amount of viral load in these patients. And it does kind of make sense because if your body's already mounted an antibody response, the window of efficacy is just going to be a bit smaller than if it's before the part at which your body's mounting a response. So I think for these patients, it's definitely positive data. They also looked at other, other metrics as well, and I'm not going to get into everything, but they did look at uh, day two alleviation of symptoms. And when they looked at the overall population of patients, it's a difference of nine with placebo to between six and eight, depending on the dose that they gave of the antibody cocktail. With the seronegative group alone, the placebo was 13 days, and then the low and high dose was six and eight, respectively. So obviously a big difference when it comes to whether or not the patient is seronegative or seropositive. So that's probably going to inform the FDA when it comes to approving the drug or giving some kind of guidance on which patients should take the drug and um, who are likely to see more positive outcomes from that. So overall, I think it's good. I think it's a step ahead of the Gilead data where I don't think we've even seen a placebo group yet. So it's nice to see Regeneron actually do this placebo controlled trial where we can see whether or not there is efficacy. And I look forward to seeing the rest of the data. I'm not sure if this merits taking a position in Regeneron right here, given that they're such a large company already and they have so many different assets that are I would say more likely to contribute to their bottom line. Um, this doesn't entice me to take a position, but it's nice to see that we're getting all these therapies, we're starting to see vaccine data, and this just makes me feel better in general that we're gonna move towards being able to treat this disease and hopefully get out from under this and then kind of recover with the economy. With that, let's talk about the main story for today, and that is Marathi Therapeutics, ticker symbol MRTX. And they're trading at a price of 162.05 per share, giving them a market cap of $7.2 billion. Their Q2 2020 net loss was $83 million, and this represents an 80% increase year over year. Their Q2 net current cash is $600 million, giving them a runway of about until 2022, I would say. But let's also be careful that if they see positive data you know, this year or next year, there's a good chance they're, they're going to raise again. And what Marathi is trying to do is develop targeted cancer treatments. And they're specifically looking at solid tumors. And even more specific than that are KRAS inhibitors. And so they have two compounds, MRTX849 and MRTX1133. They're also looking at checkpoint inhibitor resistance with their compound citrovatinib, and I'll talk about that in a bit later. To start though, we gotta talk about KRAS, and the reason why this is so important is that KRAS mutations are present in a large population of cancer patients. The first thing it's important to note is that KRAS is pretty ubiquitous. It's a critical part of the MAP kinase signaling pathway, and this is very important in basically every single cell. This pathway is involved in cell proliferation, cell survival, uh, I have differentiation here. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. And it makes it a little bit confusing because it is involved in so many different pathways that if you were just to inhibit this molecule non-specifically, you're likely to see significant side effects with patients. 
It's for this reason that it's important that we can come up with a targeted therapy that will only target cells that have a mutation in KRAS rather than the healthy, normal KRAS. To talk a little bit more about its function, it works as a GTPase, and what this means is that it takes the molecule GTP, converts it to GDP, using that phosphate group to continue the signaling pathway. I think the next step is RAF or, or MEK, something like that. Mutations in KRAS accompany 21.6% of all human cancers. And then I have here that KRAS is the predominant or exclusive RAS mutated in three of the top four neoplasms that account for cancer deaths in the U.S., lung, colon, and pancreatic cancer. Of course, I've spoken about solid tumors like this before. Lung cancer is the largest patient population of cancer patients, so it's a very attractive target for companies to go after, given that it's going to garner such a significant revenue. And this company isn't the first to target KRAS. Other companies looked at other means of trying to block the pathway specifically. But because KRAS, there's, there's things about its protein structure that make it very difficult to target. And I'm not a protein biochemist, per se. But initial attempts before these new molecules came out were trying to inhibit its ability to localize to the membrane, which is a very important step in the signaling pathway itself. And then there's other things like inhibiting the effector molecules. So molecules either upstream, which is probably more difficult, or downstream, which I've seen some success. And I think we saw that Veristem has a molecule that inhibits RAF as well. RAF and ERK are molecules downstream of KRAS. And if you can inhibit those, seemingly you could have an effect. And I think there's a lot that are still in the clinic right now. So it's possible that these, are, these will work. But since molecules have been discovered that can specifically bind to the mutated KRAS, you're going to have fewer side effects than non-targeted therapies that even say bind to RAF or ERK. And it's for those reasons that I mentioned before, that if they can just target the mutated KRAS, you're likely just to target the cells that are cancerous and are signaling aberrantly. So let's get to their first inhibitor. And this is called MRTX849, and this is a KRAS G12C inhibitor. And what this G12C means is that a glycine at the 12th position has been changed into a cysteine deleteriously, and this has led to overactive KRAS, continuing to signal through that MAP kinase pathway, apparently, in this tumor. So this compound is formally called ARS853, and it specifically binds to this cysteine. So it leaves all the other KRAS molecules alone, and it binds to this G12C in a GDP-bound state in the switch to loop, if you really want to get specific, in the low micromolar range, which is fine. So what Marathi's done is in late 2019, they showed us initial data from their phase 1-2 trial, and they looked at a grab bag of different cancers. They looked at non-small cell lung cancer, colorectal cancer, and ependycial cancer, which is cancer of the appendix. The results are shown here. For non-small cell lung cancer, they saw an overall response rate of 50% with a disease control rate of 100%. And if you remember, disease control rate includes patients that have stable disease, partial response, or a complete response. But I don't believe any of these were complete responders. For colorectal cancer, they saw an overall response rate of 25% with a disease control rate of 75%. So a little bit tougher for the colorectal cancer patients. And then ependycial cancer, we see an overall response rate of 0% with a disease control rate of 100%. So I think the takeaway here is that it's obviously a very small trial. They didn't look at a ton of patients, so it's early. But I think the fact that they did see responses in these solid tumor patients is enough to garner approval. And because the patient population is so large that there's real excitement around this. So these products might not be as effective as, say, a BRAF inhibitor with those specific patients, but because there isn't a great treatment regimen for KRAS specifically, this is something, and there is a response. So I think for that reason, it is going to garner a lot of excitement. So this was released in late 2019, and we're obviously in late 2020. So where we're at right now is Marathi is continuing their phase 1-2 studies with this compound. They are going to be presenting updated phase one, phase two data for non-small cell lung cancer and colorectal cancer at this 32nd EORTC NCI AACR symposium on molecular targets and cancer therapeutics. And this is going to happen on October 24th and 25th. 
There's a lot of excitement surrounding this given that the patient population they shared data with was so small that we're hoping to see increased numbers and that it's going to give us a sense on how it stands and how it matches up to Amgen's drug. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. The primary completion date for the study is 2020, with the overall study completion date in September of 2021, according to clinicaltrials.gov. And this is relevant because Maradi's added a bunch of different uh, combination therapies to their studies, so they're going to be looking at this molecule in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, EGFR inhibitors, as well as CDK4-6 inhibitors, and many others. So all of these are going to be going on concurrently, and we're hopefully going to be seeing updates of that in 2021 and 2022. Now, I talked a lot about the potential market, and here are some actual numbers to back that up. So the patient population that have a KRAS G12C mutation, the sum of the patients in the U.S. with non-small cell lung cancer, colorectal cancer, and pancreatic is around 70,000 patients. If we assume that they can garner a price similar to checkpoint inhibitors of around 150,000 per patient, with full market penetration, we're looking at $10.5 billion in sales per year. So it's for these reasons why I think Maradi is garnering such a generous valuation right now and why I think it could go higher if the data looks good. So I haven't spoken about Amgen's drug, but there's this big elephant in the room, and that is that besides Maradi, Amgen has a similar drug called AMG510, and it is also able to bind the cysteine in the G12C mutant of KRAS. And we've seen actually more data with regards to the Amgen drug, and there's more coming out in the next little while too. So it really seems like both of these drugs are going to be battling each other for supremacy in the KRAS space. And it's not to say that one is necessarily going to be approved and the other isn't. It's really that both are going to be competing for the same population. So we need to keep that in mind when we're doing our analysis of the whole patient population and how much revenue they could garner is that both of these drugs are likely going to be approved relatively close to one another and obviously we're very early so it's tough to really say but um, when it comes to the data I'm going to share the AMG 510 data with you and then we can kind of talk about it but they looked at colorectal cancer 39 patients the disease control rate was 79 percent with an overall response rate of eight percent for non-small cell lung cancer, they had a disease control rate of 100% and an overall response rate of 54%, which is very similar to Maradi's drug. Now, we're still looking at fewer than 40 patients here. Colorectal cancer, only 39, and non-small cell lung cancer was only 13. So, larger patient population than Maradi, data is relatively similar. The data is probably a little bit worse for colorectal cancer, but... Because Maradi's drug is only looked at four patients in this indication, you know, it's tough for us to really say right now whether or not Maradi's drug, once they increase the patient population, is going to show similar data. And one thing that I think was touched on in my WX Capital video is that as Amgen continued to expand the patients with their studies, the data began to look worse and worse. And so there is a chance that this could happen with Maradi and that, you know, people could start to think that it's not going to be any better than Amgen's drug. So there could be a little bit of hype surrounding that right now, and this could evaporate with the update. In terms of next steps for Amgen, they have phase 2 data that's supposed to be released in the second half of 2020, and this is non-small cell lung cancer, and they've already initiated a phase 3 trial. With colorectal cancer, they're doing, they have phase 2 data to be released in H1 of 2021, and then non-small cell lung cancer, non-colorectal cancer, solid tumors, they're enrolling in a phase 1B. So something else to keep in mind is that Amgen is a huge company, and they have the resources to really develop their clinical program probably faster than Maradi can. And this doesn't mean that Maradi couldn't find a partner to help with their larger trials, but Amgen is going to be powering ahead, and they're going to be a very powerful competitor against Maradi. In the clinical stage, as well as the commercialization stage, since they're going to have the sales and the marketing resources that Maradi just doesn't have. So that's the G12C right now, and I want to shift gears a little bit to Maradi's other products. The other thing they're looking at is a G12D inhibitor. So rather than the glycine turning into a cysteine, it's turned into an aspartic acid. And they have a molecule that they've shown preclinically to inhibit this KRAS molecule. Unfortunately, this is a very early drug, so they're about to file the IND 
not the NDA that I have written here. I'm just going to change that real quick. Uh, that's to be filed in H1 of 2021. And there's a lot of excitement around here because the patient population is even bigger than the G12C patient population. So we're looking at 180,000 patients amongst all of the different cancers that contain this mutation. So that's going to be exciting. We're probably not going to see data until late 2021 or probably 2022. But if they are able to see kind of similar data that they saw in the G12C, you can imagine there's going to be a real increase in the stock from that. The last product that they're looking at is a multi-kinase inhibitor, and this is, compound is called citrovatinib. It inhibits three different kinases, Tyro3, AXL, MER, as well as VEGF, R2, receptor 2, and the KIT receptors. So this compound is going to be used in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor for patients that are refractory for checkpoint inhibitors. So the studies that they're doing is citrovatinib plus nivolumab, which I believe is Updevo, and they've been able to garner some positive results so far. So I'm showing here on the right that they were able to see an overall survival of 18.1 months and 15.6 months, depending on the subset of patients. And they've shown here in the chart comparing to some of the previous data that has been seen in checkpoint inhibitors, where the average is maybe around nine months of survival. So. Where they're at right now is looking at non-small cell lung cancer, and they're expecting phase three interim analysis at the end of 2021. So this is gonna take a long time for us to see data on, which is unfortunate, but it could be a registrational trial, and they're expecting final data in 2022. Now, when it comes to the patient population here, we're looking at around 100,000 patients in second line in both USA and Europe. They're also doing other indications like bladder cancer as well as RCC. And those are phase two studies, and we're expecting data to be released probably in 2021. Now, this molecule does have potential, but the fact that the catalyst isn't going to be until the end of 2021, we're unlikely to really realize a lot of that in the stock price today. So given all of this, I want to talk about the potential market opportunity. So like I mentioned with the G12C molecule, 70,000 patients in the USA at the checkpoint inhibitor price of 150,000, we're looking at $10.5 billion. For G12D, because the patient population is so much larger, we're looking at a total max potential market opportunity of $27 billion. Citrovatinib, I'm pricing it at 50% of the CPI price because I'm assuming that this is gonna be used probably in second line or further out than checkpoint inhibitors, which are first line. So if we give it a 50% off the CPI price with a 100,000 patient population, it's around $7.5 billion. So if we add all of that together, and this is all just hypothetical, all just um, rough modeling, I would say, the total max potential yearly revenue for this company would be $45 billion. Now they're going to be battling against Amgen for this revenue. So if we just say a you know, a very conservative estimate is that Amgen's going to take half of this patient population. We're looking at a max potential revenue of $22.5 billion. And this is assuming they penetrate the market entirely, which is not very likely. And the other thing is that it's very early for these assets. Like I mentioned, the only data that we're really seeing in G12C is a small phase one, two study. And we're likely going to see the follow on data coming up at the end of October. We're going to start to approach these potential max yearly revenues. So I think for the data that we see at the end of October, we could garner probably closer to a 12 to $15 billion market cap compared to the seven where they're at today, if the data is positive or comparable to Amgen. If the data flops, there's obviously significant downside. The stock is pricing the citrovatinib data, which they've seen so far is pretty good. And there's probably some pricing in of the G12D data, given that they have some good preliminary stuff going on. But obviously, those are heavily discounted right now, since most of the excitement is around G12C. So the play that I'm making is I took a small position uh, on Friday, and I might add on dips. And then I'm going to assess after the data is released at the end of October. But like I mentioned, I'm going to be targeting, say, 12 to 15 billion market cap after the data if it's positive. And if it's negative, I'm going to reassess and kind of go from there. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the stock skyrocketed on the Immunomedics acquisition news. And this obviously is people excited because it makes you think about whether or not Marathi could be a target of M&A. 
and I think it's possible. It's tough to bank exclusively on an M&A target, to be honest, but the increase in the stock went from like 133 to 160 something, so there's obviously some hype associated with that. Overall, I think it's a pretty exciting company, and it's nice to see that they're going to have some competition with Amgen. Obviously, I'd be rooting for Marathi over Amgen, given that they're such an underdog uh, when it comes to resources and things like that. But it's exciting that we've seen some molecules come out that can target this KRAS mutation since it's been a relatively underserved patient population. And that's what I got from Marathi. So moving on for the next couple weeks, there's obviously been some crazy stuff going on. So we heard that Trump was diagnosed with um, SARS-CoV-2 positivity. He has COVID-19, so we're going to be looking for a recovery for him, hopefully. And the reason why I say hopefully is because a Biden victory would be an immediate decrease in the stock market. And I think that's because he's been pretty vocal about cutting the Trump tax cuts, which was a decrease in the corporate tax rate. So immediately taking that income from companies is going to lead to a decrease in profits and downward pressure on the stock market. So I think for those of us wanting an increase in the stock market, we want Trump to get reelected. Setting aside all the other policies, I don't want to get into that on this show, but that's kind of where we're at. So we'll see how things go. The other things that we should be looking forward to is another stimulus package. So this has been in discussion for what seems like months right now, and this is a stimulus package to help out people who are suffering with the fallout from COVID-19. And the House and the Senate have been in discussions for quite a while, and it seems like there's been some progress lately, but then we've seen that some senators have tested positive for COVID-19, and this makes me think that they're going to have a difficult time voting in person. So whether that shakes out in a positive or negative way, it remains to be seen. But I think that this could add a delay to approval of the stimulus package. And without the stimulus, I think it's going to be tough for the market to see higher highs at, at this stage. So those are the kind of things that I'm going to be looking for. Um, it's kind of wild. And we also have the election that's about a month away. So depending how all of this stuff shakes out, I could see us really either go a lot higher or go a lot lower. So it's, uh, it's kind of nerve wracking, especially because I'm so heavily invested right now. So... Let's shift gears and I want to talk about the portfolio that I have here. So I'm at around negative 2% hanging out with the Dow Jones. The XBI and IBB kind of had decreases in the last little while with uh, kind of stabilization, I'd say, of the NASDAQ and the SPX. Some of the positions I took, so I have sold Exact Sciences, I sold 89Bio like I mentioned, I bought Marathi, and I doubled down on Axavant as well as Cyclerion. We still haven't seen the Cyclerion data, which doesn't worry me too much. I think this is just a good opportunity to buy more, frankly, because I do see them uh, releasing data pretty soon, and I think it will be in the right direction. Axavant, there's a ton of hype on Twitter for that now, and it's nice to see people finally catch on. If you look at my videos on Axavant, uh, maybe three months ago or so, I think the Q4 data is going to be pretty cool and it's likely to be a massive mover for the stock, given that Parkinson's disease is such a huge patient population. So overall, my gross exposure, like I mentioned, is 93%, which is pretty high given that we're going to be in tumultuous times. But a lot of the positions I have, I just feel pretty good about going into 2021. So even if there is a dip, I might use that last 7% to add on companies I like and kind of take it from there. And that's pretty much it. So I want to thank everybody for watching. I appreciate all the support. Uh, click the like or subscribe button on YouTube. Let's get over 1,000 subscribers. That would be awesome. If you want to help out the show, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash breakingbiotech. There'll be a link in the description below. And join the Discord. It's uh, It's been fun. Definitely still early, but I think it's going to grow in a nice way, and we're going to start to get a real community going there. So with that, I'm going to end it here, but thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time.